We're going to sit down with Nate Mitchell from Oculus VR to talk about it. Please welcome him to the stage along with Josh Constein. Well, thanks for being here with me this morning, Nate. It's a very exciting morning for Oculus. Uh, a few hours ago, it just announced that the consumer edition of the Rift is going to go on sale later this year, and it's going to ship in Q1. So it's very exciting. Finally, three years after the Kickstarter. So congrats on that. Thank you very much. Cool. So I'm going to start with an easy question by demanding that you tell us how much it's going to cost. <laughs> so we haven't actually announced the, the pricing quite yet. Um, I think overall, when we look at VR, we see these two product categories. You have the high-end, high-fidelity VR experience that we're targeting with the Rift. And on the lower end, on the mobile side, we have the product that we're doing in collaboration with Samsung, Gear VR. And Gear VR today is uh, $200, uh, obviously with the Note 4 or Samsung S6 that's coming out. But on the, the higher end side, on the Rift side, it is going to be a little bit more expensive, mostly around the fact that for that higher fidelity, higher immersion VR experience, you're going to want a gaming gaming rig that you can plug into. OK, so is, is it going to be costing around like what a laptop costs, like a nice new iPhone, like Google Glass? No announcements quite yet on the, the price of the headset. But the, the one really important thing for us has always been to make it affordable. You know, we want to reach a state where we have hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people in VR. And so nailing that affordability is really at the heart of the product that we're trying to build. We do see VR ultimately as a mass market product, and we want to get there. If, if you're talking about this sort of as a game machine, mm -hmm. how is it going to be priced versus you know, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One and other gaming machines? Like, should people expect to pay, pay a little bit more because it's different technology? I think it goes back to that sort of like higher end, high fidelity experience. VR is so new, it, just like the dawn of any new platform or technology. Um, right now, because there is custom, custom hardware involved, costs are relatively high and scale is relatively low. But I think as we see more and more companies sort of entering the space, what you're going to see is costs go down, right, as scale raises and quality go up across the board. And I think that's going to be true for the PC side, the high-end, high you know, Rift side of the equation, as well as Gear VR. So you're thinking around $1,000? <laughs> that's all the information I can give you right now. OK, OK. So how are people going to be able to buy this? Are we going to be pre-ordering it on your website? Are you guys going to try to eventually sell this in stores like Best Buy? So we haven't announced uh, the total pre-order strategy yet. We are going to be taking pre-orders later this year, as we mentioned this morning. Um, so you're going to be taking them as in Oculus's website. We will probably be taking them on Oculus.com. OK, that's good news. All right, we got something out of you. But ultimately, I think uh, retail is going to be a really important part of our strategy. So far, if you look at you know, how we've sort of sold people on the idea that VR is awesome, that it's this incredible new thing, it really has been more about trial and experiencing it. Because when you put the device on and you have that first experience of being teleported um, to this other world and experiencing that sense of presence, that's when you understand sort of why VR is awesome and where it's going to go. And I think that's going to be required, again, to moving hundreds of millions of people into VR and into the Rift. So it sounds like you guys are going to have like retail installations where people can try it out, not just like a box on the wall. Like I said, we haven't uh, finalized You're smiling, so things yes. yet. <laughs> well, I think it's really important. I think if you look at what we've done so far on the marketing side, too, um, almost all of our what people would consider to be marketing is really events and getting out in front of developers and gamers and Kickstarter backers and showing them the technology and giving them a chance to experience it. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, the same is true with what we've done it, with empowering developers with the Oculus development kits. You know, we try to just get the technology out there so that people can experience it. And I think that uh, has had an enormous impact sort of on the rising tide of VR on the whole. So one of my biggest questions about this is, like, I don't own a gaming PC. Mm -hmm. Am I going to be able to run this Rift without buying something else? Is, is everything going to come in the box? You are going to need your gaming PC. Uh, that's the main thing that you are going to need to have separately. But everything else that you need for the Rift will come inside the box. OK, so Oculus will require an external and you know, third-party gaming PC to be able to run the Rift. Yes. OK, that's interesting to know. Because like, for instance, I own a MacBook. Like, I, probably am not interested in buying a PC. And that's obviously going to raise the price a lot. You talk about affordability, but it's sort of affordable if you already have this other piece of hardware. Yes. That's, so going back to sort of the expensiveness of the device, um, it really is going to be that you're, when you need that gaming sort of rig, you're going to want like a, a nice gaming rig. We're not talking about a high-end crazy computer, but something that would run modern games well today, um, plus the Rift itself. 
And so when you have those two things, we'll include everything else that you need to sort of dive into VR and have an awesome made for VR experience inside the box. Will it work with Macs? We are going to be releasing more on the technical specifications uh, in the weeks ahead, basically in the run up to E3. So actually, most of the details you want around the exact specifications of the computer that are going to run it, we're going to be talking about that very soon. So what about partnerships? Like, have you guys talked at all with Xbox or PlayStation, or Sony, and Microsoft about how you guys could work together on this kind of thing? We have. Uh, we've talked to everyone. You know, there's a lot of people right now interested in the VR space, and we've said many times that we're really interested in bringing the Rift to as many consoles or platforms as possible. Um, ultimately, we haven't announced any sort of partnerships to date, but um, it's something we're always exploring. Yeah, because I mean, I would love if I could just run it off of like a PS4, for instance. Is that something that you guys are imagining? Like maybe there's you know more interoperability on the you know on the uh, the powering side or that that back end side? Anything is possible. <laughs> That's the whole point of virtual reality, right? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, in the announcement, you guys mentioned that there's going to be um, as yet unreleased or made public gaming experience that you called our own games. Is Oculus building its own games? So the short answer to that question would be yes. Um, the longer answer is uh, we have a division within Oculus, the Oculus Studios team. It's our publishing arm. It's headed up by Jason Rubin, who's the co-founder of Naughty Dog. And Rubin's team is really looking at investing in the Oculus, uh, in the VR ecosystem and bringing awesome made for VR games primarily to the Oculus platform. Um, and so the same way that Microsoft or Sony might go out and publish a set of titles to bring them to uh, their consoles, we're doing sort of the same thing. And we think that's really critical ultimately for kickstarting this VR ecosystem. You know, right now there's a lot of risk associated with uh, building a VR application mostly around there are very few, well there are no consumer VR headsets out there today. Right? And so now with Gear VR coming later this year and the Rift shipping in Q1 2016, um, we've gone out there and we've really invested to help take some of that risk off developers and ultimately get the made for VR experiences, the, the experiences built from the ground up for VR um, that I think are really going to be the platform dis defining, like really exciting experiences that people play on the Rift day one. So it seems a little bit like Nintendo, where you know, they make their own first party games, which are really beautiful and feel really natural on their uh, mm -hmm. console. But then they also allow third party titles, including things that have been ported from other systems. Obviously, it's not really going to be a, a porting situation, considering it's. Yeah, porting is tough. <laughs> that's a little tough just to like, stick Mario into 360. Yeah. Yeah, but, it, but you guys, where, how did you get the talent to be able to make these games? Did you guys buy anyone? I know that you, you hired away like, some heads from Pixar to be able to run your story studio, which is what's making the cinema experiences mm -hmm. that you're using to sort of show off the potential of Oculus for cinema. So did you guys buy anyone or buy anyone out, like steal anyone from top game studios? I wouldn't frame it stealing anyone from top game studios. Did you hire anyone that formally worked at big game studios? I mean, and what studios are they? <laughs> so let's, there's two parts to this. One is um, Oculus at its heart really is this uh, gaming company. So most of our team comes from the games industry. We're gamers, game developers, engineers, people really trying to transform gaming. Um, and I think that was sort of you know, the call to action, sort of the revolution that we wanted to kick off when we started the Kickstarter. And that's the sort of incredible people that we've attracted in the industry. On the, to, to your original question, sort of first versus second versus third party, a better framing for my, uh, my original answer would be that we're doing all three. Mm -hmm. So where Ruben's team is investing in the ecosystem, which can often be seen as sort of second party to third party, um, we also have some small first party teams internally, like Oculus Story Studio, which is the group that you just mentioned. We also have um, some very small game teams. Actually, if you've, any of you guys have tried uh, Gear VR, which is out there today, Herobound, which is one of my favorite experiences for Gear VR, was actually built by two guys internally with the support of an external uh, studio. So we're actually already shipping some of the games that we've made internally today. What I will say is we don't have any 50, 100, you know, 300 person studios within Oculus investing in games. We really are focused more on the platform, the technology that enables awesome developers out there like, you know, the whoever it is, uh, to make great experiences that are going to knock uh, gamer socks off on the Rift ships. Cool. So I'm excited to go check out Herobound, which is now one of Oculus's first official games. It is. Um, great. 
but to play games, you're going to need to, a controller of some sort. That's one of the few things you guys have been really cagey about. Whenever you've done your demos, have all been you know just headset based. You look around a lot. Maybe you like on the Gear uh, VR, for instance, you like tap the little side pad. But the DK2 and none of the other Oculus prototypes have had a real controller. So what are you guys doing around inputs? Input is. Um it's been really tricky. I don't think anyone quite yet has cracked the code when it comes to VR input. We're going to be talking a lot more about input uh, later this year. For us, <clears throat> what I can say is that we have two, two paths, two research paths when it comes to cracking the code on input. Um, on the product engineering side, we have a team that's been focused for a long time now on sort of the one to four year outlook. What does input look like? What's the sort of input experience that we can deliver for Gen 1 or Gen 2 of VR? And then sort of parallel to that, we have the Oculus Research Division, which is a team headed up by Michael Abrash and Ottman Binstock up in Seattle. And that group is actually looking at the four to 10 year uh, horizon and trying to look at what could input look like in the future? What do we want VR input to look like? And so they're investing more in the research around the breakthroughs that need to happen to bring sort of the VR input that we all dream of to life. So I'm imagining Via One is something more traditional that we kind of like what we've seen before. Like I'm personally, I'm imagining the the Wii nunchucks, which are little like handheld things, but with joysticks on top. So you have the freedom of the joystick, but maybe some motion control and and also some like haptic feedback. You could have like vibration, for instance. But I've heard from sources that Abrash in this like crazy lab of his is testing everything from like feedback responsive gloves and all sorts of things because you know ultimately I think we'd all dream of of playing a lightsaber game where when you you know knock against somebody else's lightsaber, you actually like stop feel moving haptics, or you feel yeah. that, that resistance. Yeah. And so, uh, but at least in this Q1, is this something like, look, does it look more like a game pad or does it look like more things that you hold in your separate hands? So we're going to, like I said before, we're going to be talking a lot more about input, especially in the run up to E3, um, because this is really, like you're absolutely right, this is at the heart of how people are going to be using the Rift. Um, I think the biggest we have a multi, like I said before, a, a very diverse input strategy, not only in terms of the research and investigations that we're doing, but in terms of the way we believe people are going to use the Rift and Gear VR actually um, at the onset. And so we have a couple different things we're excited to share in the near future, um, but nothing more to announce right now. You sure? <laughs> I want to. I really do. I think one more note on input is that a lot of the experiences that people are developing right now are designed for a gamepad or the touch interface on Gear VR. And those have been really interesting to see developers sort of over the last two years with the DK1 and then DK2, and now some, of, some developers have Crescent Bays, um, investing in really building incredible gamepad experiences. And I think when the Rift ships, a lot of the experiences are going to be gamepad uh, focused and potentially we could have some other input devices in there to make things more interesting. Cool, so it sounds like you might have a more than one controller eventually. P oh, perhaps, that's, uh, that's, that's my favorite like implicit yes, is the like lean back maybe. <laughs> uh, it, what about third party peripherals? Are you guys gonna allow people to build you know, extra things like surfboards that I could stand on or steering wheels or things like that? The short answer is yes, I think the, um, for us, we're really focused on delivering uh, out-of-the-box, awesome VR experience that's sort of all-inclusive. Like you said, it's like, if, when I get the Rift, is everything going to come with it? We want to nail that. And enabling developers to be successful, there really does need to be standardized input and standardized tech specs. Um, and so that is really our key focus, is making sure our developers are successful. That's something we're sort of obsessed with on the platform side. When we think about the Rift, we really do think, we think about Oculus as you know, trying to build the absolute best VR platform and a platform where we're enabling developers to be extremely successful. And third party peripherals don't always fit as well with that vision, right? If you want to make a surfboard game, sure, you can go out and do that. But um, sort of the, the audience that you're going to be able to address is going to be much smaller. Right. And so right now, again, that focus is on nailing the user experience for the broadest market. And that's what the Rift is all about, consumer VR that we've been waiting for. Talking about creating the best platform, you know, that to me sounds a bit more like a polished, more regulated platform like iOS than something that's super open to developers and uh, less regulated but more liberated uh, like Android. You know, what kind of regulations are you guys going to be putting on experiences? Like, is there some level of like this is too, this makes you too nauseous, this is like too gory or scary? Like, how are you guys going to regulate that kind of stuff? 
So I think, like I was just mentioning, first and foremost, we think about building the absolute best VR platform. Um, and then second to that, it's building the best VR platform that makes our developers super successful. I can point to a little bit what we're doing on Gear VR today. Mm -hmm. So on Gear VR, we have the Oculus Store available now. We actually have a curated experience where a developer will upload their build and we'll work with them to sort of distribute that worldwide. That's something we do think is incredibly important because we want people to have a phenomenal user experience on the Oculus platform and one that they know, you know, whatever game that they go download is going to be absolutely stellar. Um, I think you can expect something very similar on the Rift because we're going to mirror those, uh, those sorts of things. But ultimately, I think our strategy on Innovator Edition with Gear VR and shipping development kits as fast as we can, enabling developers to build experiences, um, and having them really help shape the Rift and the Oculus ecosystem, um, that's the way we think about more of an open platform. And I think, I think we've been pretty successful on that. So you guys are thinking of it open in the sense of developers get a lot of uh, you know, time to try things out and build for it. You guys open source a lot. But in terms of what finally reaches the consumers, maybe like a little bit tighter of a grip to make sure nothing too weird happens in VR. Yeah, I mean, you don't want already, like random heart attacks or people like having PTSD. Of course not. But I think for us, like I mentioned before, it's about the VR platform first. And that curated experience is right there on Gear VR. Um, and we are working with developers right now on that. They're obviously making money today. You guys bought a company called Nimble, which was sort of like a leap motion style motion controller. We haven't heard a single word about it since. What's up? I can't comment too much on what the uh, Nimble team is doing right now, um, but we'll reveal more in the, the months and years ahead. If you work at Nimble, please DM me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but on a, on a much higher level, you know, we've talked a lot about the specifics. But what I really want to know is, what does Oculus define as success? Is that us spending as much time as possible in virtual reality? We have two framings for success. The first would be sort of what I talked about before, that obsession with making developers successful. Because if we can make developers successful, then this VR ecosystem that we've been sort of throwing all our weight behind, sort of pouring our hearts and souls into over the last three years, is going to get the, the lift off that it needs to really bring um, VR to the mass market and ultimately make Oculus successful. Uh, I think that really is, for us, the main uh, driving force. OK, but do you want, a, like, is one of your metrics like users spending more time in VR? Or you know, I know, like, for instance, like Facebook, they gain a lot when users use the product mm -hmm. more. Google gains less when they use it for more time. You know, what is your guys' philosophy on how much time people should spend in VR? I mean, obviously, we want to drive engagement and retention. Those, I mean, that's the simple, simple sort of metrics. We want to have awesome experiences where people are coming back every single day to play the Rift um, and have just a stellar experience. We haven't, internally, I mean, I have my own uh, metrics that I would love to see. Ultimately, I think if we deliver a great product that people are excited about and that they're using every day, then we've definitely had success. And it's not, there's also, there's success in the short term, like what is success for Gear VR, its consumer launch, and Rift, its consumer launch, what do those look like? But for us, our focus is really not only that, but the long term. And again, getting VR out to the mass market and making, delivering an awesome consumer VR product see, as see well. My, my worry is not that this isn't going to be popular enough. It's the opposite. It's <laughs> that we're going to have people neglecting their kids, people losing social contact, or people spending all their time in here, people truly addicted. And so you know, do you guys have to have sort of a lack of apology for people abandoning their lives for VR? I don't think so. I think because I'll say this: I've heard sources say that a motto inside of Oculus is "fuck reality." <laughs> I have not heard that motto inside of Oculus, but maybe I'm hanging out with the wrong people. Um, I think for us, again, it's just about delivering a great consumer product and giving developers and users the ability to decide how they want to to use it. I think in some ways we should be so lucky as to having people coming back to the Rift every single day. That would be a dream come true for me and Palmer. Um, and I, you know, that's what we're driving toward. Cool. So to, to quickly recap some of the things that you talked about, you gave us a lot of news, actually, which I'm really excited about, including that you know, Oculus wants to be affordable, but it's going to be in that high-end range. People are going to need a, uh, a gaming PC to power this. Um, it's those two things together that are going to make it a little bit more expensive for that true 
holodeck-like experience. Right, and you guys are going to take pre-orders from Oculus.com, but are also working on a retail experience, potentially allowing people to uh, to try it out in person, and you know that eventually you guys are trying to make this a, uh, an open platform in terms of the development of hardware and experiences, but what gets to the end user has to be polished because this is going to replace reality in some ways for us, so I hope you guys don't screw it up. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Cool, thank you very much for talking with me. My pleasure, absolutely. Cheers.